Chris. Great to finally uh, meet you here via Zoom. I look forward to meeting you in person. I'm looking forward to hear your story and uh, taste your amazing lineup. So tell me. Yeah. Well, Oscar, first of all, just thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. I know it's uh, been a little bit back and forth and in the middle of harness, but excited to finally uh, do this video with you. Um, so background story, um, Christopher Sellers started in 2019. My wife and I, we partnered with Hal Bartholomew and Beverly Brodigan. They're a family out of Elk Grove and they actually own the Bartholomew Family Vineyards, which is the property that uh, the winery sits on. And so in 2019, my dad, he's a general contractor. We took their 3,000 square foot metal barn that was actually used uh, as tractor storage. Um, they had a lot of farmland prior to 2007. And so they were growing weeds and selling it to other farmers. And then they sold off some parcels and then they just had a 10 acre parcel. And so 4.6 acres are planted on site. And in 2019, we converted this into a winery, full production. Took me about nine months. Uh, we did it all ourselves. It was my dad, myself, and uh, one other gentleman. And we put the glycol lines in. We're sitting in the cellar, by the way. You're gonna see me look back a little. So it holds at 58 degrees. And then uh, I manage the vineyard, make the wine, and then my wife and I, we run the tasting room. Um, and so it's just a small boutique winery. We do source some fruit outside of uh, the property. And actually, we just replanted two months ago. So we ripped everything out in October 2020. And uh, we replanted Barbera, Sangiovese, Montepulciano, Alianico, Fiano, Tempranillo, Granacha, Petit Syrah, and Geraldigo. So a lot of Italian and Spanish varietals. We're going all traditional head train, three feet off the ground, like that goblet style. And then uh, for the most part, that's going to be our entire production in about four years. And we'll do 90% the estate fruit only. But in the meantime, while we're pivoting on that, we're gonna be sourcing fruit from other vineyards. And so that's a little little background of what we're doing and kind of where we're at right now. Well, but what, what triggered you to, to get into the, uh, the wine business? Okay, well, okay, so that's a long story. Um, so at 18 years old, I needed a job to pay for college. And uh, so my I'm at my buddy's house and uh, we I lived in Lodi, which is uh, very it's the number one, you know, bitter culture uh, with farming and there's over a hundred wineries now. And so my buddy's dad worked at Woodbridge Winery, which is this large production site. Uh, for any wine drinkers, uh, no affordable bottle. It's Robert Mandavi uh, Chardonnay. You get the 1.5 milliliters <laughs> or oh, 1.5 liter, that's what it is. Right. And, uh, uh, yeah, nice, nice, affordable Chardonnay. And so my uh, buddy's dad worked there and it was harvest season and I needed a job. So I started working at Woodbridge Winery and I worked 65 hours a week graveyard. And then I went to a community college in Stockton uh, during the day. And within the first week, I fell in love with the business. It was just fascinating to me uh, watching grapes come in. And then, you know, three weeks later, you have wine. And I just fell in love with it. Ended up working there for about three years. And then at a certain point, I couldn't go any further in the business because I didn't have a degree. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting a little frustrated. At that point, I knew school was still not for me. So I stopped uh, going to college and I started working at a French fine dining restaurant called Boulevard Bistro, which is in the city of Elk Grove. That's where I met my wife. Uh, my father-in-law was the chef and owner. And so, uh, that then transitioned to, I met a winemaker while working there and I'm taking care of the table. I was the server. My wife is the sommelier, by the way, at the restaurant. Oh, wow. And so um, I learned a lot of my wine knowledge and tasting actually from her and her father uh, from the restaurant. And so, yeah, this winemaker came in and he was a winemaker and owner of a boutique winery in Lodi. And after about 10 minutes of talking to him, he hires me on the spot to be his cellar master. And I was still working at Woodbridge Winery and, and at the restaurant at that time. So I gave my two week notice at the, uh, the Woodbridge Winery and I started the next day at Jeremy Wine Company. And uh, yeah, I worked there for four and a half years. And in the meantime, Al Bartholomew and Beverly, they've known my wife since she was about 10 years old. And they kept hearing my name pop up oh, this is what Chris is doing. You know, this is what Chris is doing. And I started making my own wine at 20. 
and you know just playing around doing fermentation and uh, that transitioned into my resume my own making my own wine you know that was the resume for me and so 2019 Hal wasn't really happy with how things were going with the vineyard and the little side project he had so he reached out to my wife to sit down and discuss uh, things with uh, me and her and that turned into Christopher Sellers being born. And so, uh, yeah, we just went all in. We actually sold our house so that we could get enough uh, capital to to invest. And then we got, um, you know, the pandemic, right? That was, that was our opening day. So March 7th, we opened of 2020, March 7th of 2020 to start selling wine. We were open for one day. We had 450 people. So this whole room was full of people. We were pouring wines, we got all these wine club members. We sold over a pallet of wine. Like the sky was the limit. Like we were so pumped. <laughs> and then the next day, CSD sent a uh, sent a letter out in an email. I was a uh, head coach of my daughter's T-ball league. And uh, sports got canceled. And then you know the rest, like March 16th or 17th, the whole world shut down. And Elk Grove Unified was the first school district in the United States to shut down. So that was like breaking news. Elk Grove was put on. So uh, yeah, we were shut down all of 2020. We then reopened March 7th of 2021. And we became actually a tasting room on site. During all of 2020, we were in a vet center and a winery. And that was kind of our route to market. We were going to hold events. We then pivoted completely. Um, we've actually stopped doing events almost at all. And we're now a full tasting room. And we just set up barrels inside here. And so when we're not harvesting fruit and barrels move around, it's all nice and pretty and they're all stacked. And then we have some standing barrels that we just do tastings that way. So, Wow, man. So you, you talk about being all in and committed to a project, right? I mean, you did it. And unfortunately, like everybody else, you know, COVID hit and it shocked everyone. But you know what? I think what the, the greatness that I see about a lot of the wineries, like yourselves, the resilience is there, right? Yeah. Resilience, persistence, and you guys, and, and and no one's giving up. Everyone's like, you know what? Oh, we're yeah. going to work toward it and we're going to get this through. And I mean, a lot of people pivoted from uh, to really... Uh, get their online game on their websites to work properly right uh the shipping shipping to be like pretty much nothing as long as you know, as long as you buy the wine to cover the shipping which is awesome because i think yeah. I, I, think I picked up a lot of drinking during covid right? there was just such great sales of wine and, and you felt like you were giving back you were like you know i'm, I'm supporting this other winery i'll go buy a case of them and so forth so it, it was it was a i think it was a moment for a lot of people to reevaluate their business right and really yeah. think about that well, it was huge for us. I mean, we we went from being a model, a business model of we're going to see 400 to 500 people at a time. We're going to hold, you know, 20 events and we're going to be sold out of our wine. That was the initial concept. And what we did on our first event, that was going like just what we did in numbers wise, that was going to make sense. So we had a good plan put together. Obviously, you can't predict the pandemic. And so we pivoted immediately. I bought many vodka bottles, uh, little plastic bottles that, you know, 100 milliliters. And we did wine tasting to go, put a big eight foot sign out at the corner of Elk Grove Boulevard of Bradshaw. So people would drive up and it was kind of like going to like McDonald's or something, you know, they drive up, honk their horn and they, and I have these little pre-made and every morning I'd wake up and I would pre-make these bottles and label them and do Zoom calls. Like what we're doing, I did yeah. this once a week. Uh, just going on Zoom calls. And sometimes, you know, it was very humbling. I mean, there was sometimes it was one person and then there was others where there was 50. And so yeah. it really ranged and I just kept going at it and going. And uh, what I found was that the city of Elk Grove and really the neighboring cities too, Lodi, Sacramento, the amount of support that we got blew my mind. I mean, that was the biggest thing I was nervous about starting in Elk Grove because we are now part of five other wineries here. So it's not it's not like Lodi, where there's a hundred in, you know, 102, I think now, you know, so it's, you know, it's 15 minutes away, but still, I mean, they're very developed. We're brand new, even though we're still in the Lodi Appalachian, we're still in the city of Elk Grove. And so, uh, you know, I was fearful of, well, is it gonna click with people? Are they gonna show up? And 
the amount of support is just insane. The pandemic hit and we would have people show up, buy a case of wine, not even try anything, D didn't do the wine tasting deal, just bought a case just to say, hey, we want to support a small business. We know you guys are new. We just saw your post on Facebook. <laughs> and then social media was huge for us. We had a really big social media plan when we launched. Um, actually, prior to opening in March 7th, we had like 30 influencers come out and preview all of our wine. So we had a pretty decent understanding or a little bit of a plan put together of, to grow the, the social media. And, and we got a photographer involved and a videographer. And, you know, some things were a bust. I will say there's been a lot of learning curve. You put this plan together and you're like, oh yeah, this is going to blow up and da, da, da. And it did nothing. And then what I've realized <laughs> is doing videos like this and being very authentic and, uh, and not going the very fancy route is really what people want to see. They want to see the behind the scenes. They're okay with the little funk on the barrel. You know, they want to see it all just like they would in person. And so right. we're trying to deliver more of that. Uh, it's hard though for me to get behind the camera and bring the same energy and passion when the camera's on me versus in person. And that's where I, I sell in a little bit better, so. Well, that's good. I think, you know, the I love to do this because I get people get to really hear your story, right? If you're too busy when someone goes and visits your your um, your tasting room, well, they they miss Chris, right? They're like, hey, but I can go on online, see his video, see what he's all about, how he started. Besides, you know, it's really bringing your about us on your website to life, right? It's really yeah. just putting that together, and people are like, hey, we relate to it, and I love that. I love the fact that you know, you're, I've seen so many barrel rooms become these tasting rooms and then there's yeah. this and it's I, I was at one yesterday and this whole he had, he had very similar it's beautiful room and it was really a big you know it was a little you could buy your wine there you could taste your wine it was this nice sitting area and now when i went in there all he has is all the barrels all wrapped up to cover it up all he has is nice little table where you go and order and you go yeah. outside and drink right but it is uh very functional yeah. people you know if people just go in there and do their business. It's still very attractive in there, but outside is where it's all at now, right? And I, I'm really big on that. You know, it's, there is so much great wine out there at all price points. It's no longer, and, and technology has advanced so much. I mean, we have temperature control, you know, all of our tanks are plumbed with glycol. So, you know, the advancements in winemaking are just, out of this world so making a good product is that's entry level like you right. that's that's automatically assumed you're going to make a good product now it's what's your brand message how do you treat people i mean that's a big thing is like customer service and uh making people feel comfortable you know the wine business uh for a long time there made it so tough for people just to feel comfortable of asking a question Right. You know, and you still see it. I mean, I still get it um, to, to this day of, you know, feeling uncomfortable of pronouncing, you know, Tempranillo. You know, they're, you know, they want to, they're like, I don't know how to say that and, you know, and ask different questions. And, and that's really unfortunate. And so that's here at Christopher Sellers. We're the complete opposite. I'm super casual. If you look to my, you know, all the way down, I got boots on, I wear shorts. <laughs> uh, you know, I wear the same black tee every day. It's not a suit and tie. Um, spot, but the wines are age worthy. They, they, we take the craft really serious, but we want to be able to present it in a way that everyone feels comfortable and everyone feels, you know, welcomed. Yeah, you know, from all different brackets. It's not just uh, the suit and tie only, you know, and and the pinkies up. You know, we're yeah. we're definitely giving wine, and and all of our wines are really dry. We don't make a sweet wine. Um, and that's our style, you know, uh, I come from the French fine dining restaurant side um, and food pairings. And so for mm -hmm. us, going dry um, will help elevate that dining experience. Unless you're eating like Thai food, then sweet wines kind of go well with that. But for the most part, you know, dry wines really go well with food pairings. And so that's that's the style we're, we're hitting. And so it's not for everyone, but, uh, you know, there's all these different expressions. And so it, it just makes it a lot more on doing it that way and being able to present it also and that's huge with the industry right now and you know since i received your package i haven't uh you know having a corvin i haven't even sneaked a taste yet so i'm looking forward to uh, yeah. uh 
doing this live with you because I haven't even tasted any of your wines. Yes. So there's no preconceived notion yet, right, of what your cool. wine is all about. So I like to do well, that. So yeah, let, well, let's dive in. Okay, yeah. so the the first wine here is our 2020 Chardonnay from the Shin Ranch Vineyard. Um, this is a really remarkable vineyard. It started in 1962. They had Tokay vines. And if you're familiar with Lodi history at all, Tokay vines were a red table grape. Um, it's really what put Lodi on the map in the beginning. And so in 1992, instead of pulling the Tokay vines out, they grafted over to Chardonnay. So it has the own rooted old rootstock system. And then pretty much it's getting about three to four tons per acre. We make it two ways and at the end blend it together. So 80% of the juice goes into new French oak barrels where it's barrel fermented for about 30 days. And then we stir the barrels once a week for the remaining six months. The other 20% goes into stainless steel tank, cold ferments for about 22 days. And then we hold it in that tank for the entire six month period. At the very end, we blend it together and you get a nice balance. What we find with this vineyard in particular is it's a very tropical, a lot of tropical uh, aromatics on the palate. With the stainless steel though, that 20%, it gives you that nice bright finish. So it, it's a nice balance. It gives you that, you know, the oak, the new French oak gives you all that creaminess. It's not buttery in my opinion. I mean, I, I don't get a whole lot of that butter feel to it. It's very creamy. Um, on on the nose and on the palate, that vanilla really comes through. And so this is a, the, the story behind the Chardonnay is actually quite funny. When we started Christopher Sellers, uh, you know, keep in mind, like I said, we partnered in 2019. My wife knows our partners really, really well. And, you know, for, for years and years and years, they've interacted. Um, for me, I'm kind of new to the group and I had no idea that Beverly, her favorite wine was Chardonnay. And so we're sitting in our meeting, you know, contracts are signed um, and harvest is coming around the corner. And uh, she says, so what white wine are you making this year? And I said, oh, we're not gonna make any white wine. We're gonna be 100% red. And I, and I start going into the whole philosophy and the business model. And uh, she says, well, the only wine I drink is Chardonnay. And I said, well, shit, I guess we're making Chardonnay. And uh, <laughs> So she starts laughing and I called Bill Shin and luckily they had two rows available. And so we were able to snag some Chardonnay and they make several passes in the vineyard and, and now the program has tripled. So it's our number one selling wine is the Chardonnay. So I'm really glad uh, for Beverly uh, suggesting that we do Chardonnay because it, it's done so well. Our first vintage sold out in four months. So. Yeah, I love the, I love that uh, tropical aromatics that you pick up, right? That's yeah. the fruit is really really nice, very elegant. It's like I was yeah. like, wow, it's very nice. I, I love the uh, like you said that that vanilla hints and so forth that sits on your palate. That was I, I was like, wow, that was as you were speaking, I was picking all that up as well. So, man, and it's super. I, I would have loved to have this a little bit more chilled. Yeah, so, yeah. But this is uh, outstanding. I love that in your price point. What 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 came up with your price point? Why are you why are you selling it at twenty eight dollars? Uh, you know, we're we're trying to be still affordable while delivering, I think, a high quality product. Uh, uh, you know, for me, growing up in the low middle class, you know, I want to, even though. You know, if you look around in here, there's all these French oak barrels we buy brand new. We're not using oak additives, uh, staves or, or chips or anything like that. So the, the craft wise, we're taking it really serious and, and not cutting any corners. We're buying from high quality producing uh, vineyards, um, but we're still also trying to hit that sweet spot of, you know, we want to be, you know, approachable to everyone and, and have mm -hmm. all different income brackets be able to try our wine. So. Yeah, that, that's really where that price point's coming from, uh, the, the 28. Um, you know, I will say we might move up the price for the next vintage, probably to 30 to 32, just because uh, as you're probably seeing, it's everywhere right now, inflation. Um, yeah. I actually got a call from my glass company. Our glass is going up by 44%. Uh, wow. And so, yeah, I mean, across the board, things are really jumping, whether it's corks, 
capsules, uh, you name it. Uh, it prices are going up this, like in real time right now. So yeah, I mean, I, it, I look at I look at a lot of the, the Chardonnays are usually pr uh, priced between twenty eight to you know thirty five to forty dollars, right? And yeah. that's and this is what I, I figured when I tasted your wine. It's it, it, I love that. That's I still feel it on my palate. That salt, little butter in the back. I mean, that just it's it's so great. And uh, to have this price, that that is such a good entry level for anyone to try your product, right? Yeah. So I know that there's there's an easy barrier to entry. Uh, so someone would say, I can't go wrong. It's a bottle, twenty eight bucks. Let's try it and see how it goes, right? So definitely, and and especially being handcrafted. I mean, there's a point where you know because we. You know, even though we are priced at that, sometimes we do get pushed back that it's still on, you know, maybe it is high. And, uh, you know, for me though, we're not, we don't do anything mechanized. I mean, it is literally all hands on deck. Uh, and by hands, we're talking my hands, touching <laughs> every single piece. And, and so we're not, we don't have the economy of scale like these other large wineries. So when you're seeing like $15 a bottle, like we just, that's a totally different product and it has its place in the market. But, you know, for us, you know, a, a good entry level into a, a boutique winery, you know, at 25, 26 and up is uh, that's that's a good starting spot. So, no, it, it is. I think and I think that's great because, like you said, I I, I think I paid like twenty five dollars for four for a four pack of crafted beer yesterday. And I yeah. didn't realize that I, I was like, did I just pay twenty five dollars? I'm like, yeah, but it's really good. So I, I'm like, who cares, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, but, but I did. I, when you look at when people say it's small batch, and this is probably the last vintage you're going to get out of it. You know, people do want to put their hands on it and, and buy yeah. it, right? Especially if it's so good as as this is. Who would? It's it's a great you know great uh, way to invest in 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 your brand because you know if you could do something this good with a Chardonnay they're going to want to taste the rest of your lineup, right? Definitely, definitely. So I mean, that's the hope at least, right? So, and and I will say, you know, that Chardonnay we released in May of 2021, and we have now doubled the production for the 2021 vintage. Okay. Uh, we got eight tons this year. And so, uh, you know, it, it's it's a wine that's just really, uh, really selling well and, and doing really well. So we couldn't be more excited about it, so. Especially with this with this weather that we're having, right? I don't think yeah. Chardonnay or <laughs> we're going to be tasting Rat and extra rosé is gonna. It's 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 not going to go away throughout the year, man. I mean, the, the weather is so crazy nowadays. Uh, we could have this all day. Well, yeah, and and talking about that, let's let's move to the the Malbec rosé. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a fun one. So this started in 2019. This is the 2020 vintage, but in 2019, okay. I want to get, kind of give you the background story of it. Okay. Um, I took over farming, right? The Bartholomew family vineyards. And there was eight rows of Malbec. And typically when you think of rosé for me, especially if you're going on the dry side, you're paying attention to the acidity level. You want mm -hmm. that crazy high acid, really zippy, really fresh. And so in 2019, we kept going through the vineyard. And since it was my first year farming it, I was pulling samples once a week, just tracking all the numbers, seeing where the TA was, the pH, the ML, and just following all the numbers. And what we found was that the Malbec was really great at holding on to the acidity. And so I was talking to my wife and she loves sparkling wine. And she said, why don't you pick a few tons and do a sparkling Malbec rosé? And I said, Okay, let's do it. So we went out there, we picked two tons ourselves, processed it, and as it was fermenting, the entire winery was just engulfed in grapefruit and and melon, and it just was gorgeous. And so I said, well, we're not gonna do a sparkling, we're gonna do still rosé. And it was our hottest selling wine in the pandemic. We sold out in like two to three months. It went so fast. So this Malbec, we did the entire Malbec Rosé, or the Malbec uh, eight rows of it. We did the entire production, so it doubled uh, completely. And uh, yeah, well, what I do on the winemaking side is we bring it in, we directly press it, and because it's Malbec and it's thicker skinned, as soon as we break that skin, we get that pretty pink color. We don't need to cold soak or sit on the skins at all because we would extract the tannin and we, would, we don't want to do that. So we just directly press it all the juice goes into a nice large tank and we cold ferment it, let it sit. And what I do is as soon as it hits one brick, I drop the tank temperature and we stick it 
at about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 bricks. So there's a little bit of sugar in there, but the wine is so dry. It is such a, I mean, the, the acid is so high that it kind of gives you that perception of, of sweetness just a little bit to kind of soften it because the pH is like a 3.05. So it's a very, very, very um, high acid wine. So that little bit of sugar kind of rounds it all out. Um, but it's really, really pretty and uh, it, it's just a fun wine. It's a great poolside wine for a hot day. Man, very, very good. And this is six months in stainless steel. Yep. Yeah. So we uh, we bottle it in March, um, and this year because we don't have any more Malbec, um, we pulled out the whole vineyard. We're probably going to pivot to a uh, Barbera Rosé moving forward. So this is the last of its kind. I think we have uh, like 30 cases left or something like that. And so it's uh, it's definitely a, a hot seller, and it's a great price. You know, 22 bucks. Uh, so it's. People are buying this one by the case when they taste yeah. it. <laughs> and, I, and I love you have such you're very pretty tannins, but and you said you don't you know you just cold soak. No, oh, no so no, no, cold, no cold. We just soak. press it. We just direct press. So no no interaction, but just that little bit of skin contact in that press, it, we get that pretty pink color immediately. Uh, Man, this is really yeah. pretty. I, I would have thought you know to to achieve this. You would have done a little some cold pressing, but man, this a cold soak. Sorry, this is really pretty, man. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that Malbec is, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people are shocked that we do a Malbec rosé. It's not something you mm -hmm. ever hear of, uh, and and the reason being is Malbec um, isn't this huge berry. Typically, you do Pinot you know, Noir or Cinso or, or Carignan or even Barbera. They're bigger berries, and you're going to get more mm -hmm. juice, so you're going to get a higher yield and. It kind of helps with the price point mm -hmm. um, and they are more acid driven. Uh, but yeah, like I said, this Malbec, those eight rows were able to hold on to that great acidity. And so uh, it worked out. Um, wow. The next wine on the list is, is my go-to drinking wine right now. I'm so proud of this wine. It's our 2020 Senso um, out of Lodi. We made only two barrels. And uh, sadly to say, we only have six cases left to sell. So I wish I uh, wish I had a bunch more. We just released it to the wine club, and uh, it's just a great summer red. And so, Cinso is a uh, Cote de Rhone um, French varietal. It's typically in blends. No one really hears about it or sees it in a standalone. Um, but unlike Pinot Noir, Cinso loves the heat and it loves the dry climate, and so it grows phenomenal in Lodi. Actually. One of the oldest vines that uh, Cinso in the world is in Lodi, which is pretty remarkable. This is uh, not the same vineyard though. So this is coming out of Clements Hill and we actually did three fermentations and then blended them all together and then bottled it in six months. So the first fermentation, we did a whole cluster. We took a bin, picked the grapes right, and then we sorted out the leaves there was no rot, it was really, really clean. And so then we foot treaded, did, did some foot stomping, right? Stomp. <laughs> so we get some juice going and we did a native fermentation. And then the next bin, we did a whole berry fermentation, which is where we take the machine and we gently destem it and the berries are fully intact. So we didn't crush it. Um, and we're, you're gonna get a slight carbonic fermentation the first few days. And then the, huh? sec, the third fermentation, is we did a carbonic maceration. So we took 30 pounds of dry ice and layered it in a bin, put the grapes, whole cluster inside, sealed it, plastic wrapped it, and then five days later, pressed it off and it dropped three bricks and then it's stainless steel fermented all the way through. And at the end of six months, we blended all the wines together. So all since so just three different fermentations and you got this beauty and it is, like it's my go-to drinking wine right now. I get off work, I get a bottle. It is so beautiful, so pretty, insanely aromatic, very mm -hmm. light on the palate, very easy to drink. This is a great introduction to red wine if you don't like red wine or if you're not used to red wine. And it is so dry, but what's really neat about it is it's so fruity, like there is no sugar at all. We fermented it all the way through but all that wow. fruit is coming through because of the fermentation styles that we hit. 
that it has this like once again like a perception of sweetness um because of how fruity it is and it's just really approachable really easy to drink um and i love it on days like today's you know here in elk grove i think it's like 98 degrees so you get off work and it's still like 80 degrees outside and you take this bite baby home and you're you know i, I do a slight <laughs> chill on it i'll go like okay. well for me i pull it out of the cellar so it's 50 right. degrees and when i say slight chill that's what i mean I, i'm not saying refrigerate the wine um, I, I typically tell people if you're going to you know you're going to drink this wine put it in the fridge for about 30 minutes pull it out let it sit for 20 and then it'll be in that 58 60 degrees and it's just really approachable and easy easy drinking no beautiful i love the the aromatic the nose of this is just and you you know it's just so i love it's very fruit forward you know yeah. you, you get the very. strawberry you get the strawberry on this very very well the cherries everything i mean wow yeah, it, it's like a cherry bomb kind of goes off in your glass. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful wine. It's one of those wines too that I keep going back um, when it's in my glass. I just keep smelling it and smelling it. I let it open up. Um, it's just very, very pretty. And I, once again, I just love how smooth it is. It has that great acid, so it still can handle some food, uh, you know, paired well with it. And it's just, yeah, beautiful wine. Yeah, that that tart cherry. That's what I yeah. pick out of my palate, right? So yeah. That's good. I mean, the, uh, this is like in a nice, beautiful day. Seventy-five. I don't even care, man. Seventy-five yeah. or hundred degrees. This is. <laughs> yeah. It, it presents so itself very well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at Christopher Sellers, when you come in, all of our wine glasses are Riedel, and okay. and I tell you what, it does make a massive difference in the enjoyment process of just like going through it. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, hey, if you got a tumbler, go for it. You know. Because I can exactly. go park watching my kids and I'll drink it out of the coffee mug. So. <laughs> exactly. You know, it, it, I, I just got uh, some glassware from one of these companies. I don't want to name them yet because I'm going to do a thing for them. But uh, and it's it's you know and it does. I think it really does play uh, a difference on your wine how it opens up and so forth. Uh, but I think you know you're, you're creating a whole experience for your clients right and that's what they want to keep coming back to you're educated them on glass where you educated them on temperature uh and the type of wines you're making you know and that's really important so yeah. so what do we okay. so what do we do your so the next one old vine barbera so this once again wow. you're going to keep hearing me say this as you go through these wines these vineyards that we source from are remarkable so this is from the noma vineyard Leland Noma is a third generation uh, wine grower and he was a part of the, one of the first plantings of Barbera in Lodi. And so Davis actually reached out to a lot of different growers in Lodi in 1970 and said, hey, we got these cuttings, um, we're doing some trials, who's interested in planting this? And so he planted Barbera. And, you know, unfortunately for him on year two, you're typically what you're supposed to do is as the vine's growing up, you tie it and then you cut it, you know, the next year. So it doesn't girdle the vine. And so one of his supervisors did not cut all the vines. And so it girdled it. And so the tonnage ever since that year three has been cut in half the entire oh, wow. time. And so now the vines are 50 years old. Um, so it's considered old vine uh, Barbera now. And it's only getting, I think, like four tons to the acre. We pick it a month earlier than everyone else in Lodi. And he thought I was crazy in 2019. I told him, hey, yeah, let's pick it. And he's like, what do you mean? Like, you're a month early, Chris. And I said, well, we're, we're going more the Piedmont style. We're, we're not shooting for 28 bricks. And uh, a lot of people like to make uh, Barbera very ripe. And to me, at, a, at those higher sugar levels, everything starts tasting the same. Barbera starts tasting like Zin and Zin starts tasting like Syrah. And, and so for for me, we picked it at 23 bricks. Wow. So this is only a 13, I think, and a half percent alcohol wine. And I was actually not even paying attention to the sugar. I was paying attention to the pH. So okay. we, went, we went very, very uh, high acid on it. It was like a 3.3 pH. Um, when we picked it. And so it's just really, really pretty. We did French oak. 
Um, sat it in there for 18 months. And so it's just a gorgeous wine. Highly recommend decanting this one. Um, but yeah, a lot of strawberries and, and cherry. All right. This is beautiful. Just, just, yeah. I just, as I, you know, I, I love to decant my wine. I have a V spin. So I just love, you know, being there five minutes and, and it just opens up more. Then I'm like, give it another five more minutes. And that's like a couple already, like two other hours, right? Yeah. So yeah, this is beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. yeah. It, and we only made three barrels um, of this wine. We, 2020, we made uh, a few, few more barrels. I think we have like six total for 2020. So we're going to be bottling that on March 7th. No, March 4th, March 4th of 2022, we'll be bottling some more. Uh, but yeah, it's just a beautiful vineyard. We're getting eight tons this year. So we really, really doubled down on this vineyard because it really makes uh, remarkable, remarkable wines. And so. Oh man, you decided to put this smile in my face. I've been trying, man. This yeah. Yes. So good. I've had some really great Barberas and man, this is up there. I love yeah. your description. It, it really lives up to being voluptuous. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, it, it, I'm not even trying to grin. It just, it just does it for you, man. This is so good. Yeah. I love it. The beautiful tannings. The aromatics are great. Man, the, you, like I said, the acidity level is is, is, yeah. is really well, you know. Uh, it's a balance. Balanced. Really yeah. well balanced on this, man. And you only made very few cases of it. I mean, very few barrels of this, right? Yeah, so this, that that production, the 2019 was our first year. We only have um, three barrels. And I will say, I think, I think we're down to like, I, I think we're down to 25 cases if I was gonna just guess off the top. Because we did, we, we, three of these wines we released in the August Wine Club. And so they consumed pretty quickly. So, uh, you know, where we're getting a low on this one, but we do have more to come um, for the 2020 vintage. And so, yeah, it's just a gorgeous wine though. It I, is. I get, yeah, Barbera is my favorite wine um, to to not only make, but to drink. Uh, it's just, I, I love anything Italian and I love the Italian style. Uh, and sometimes, you know, in Lodi, there was a trend for a while there and it's definitely changed. I mean, we're starting to see a big pivot what I find with this growing region is when you pick early, you're still able to get all the fruit that give you that fruit forward, that really beautiful nose that you find in Lodi wines, right. but you're still able to get all that acid as long as you pick at that, you know, 23, like we got Old Vine Carignan in the other room here fermenting and we are doing 100% whole cluster and it's a 3.3 pH. So Lodi can really do these <coughs> acid driven wines depending on when you pick it. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a beautiful expression. I really, really love it. Yeah, so the Zen, uh, to get into that one. So you have the Barbera. If you go down the street, he uh -huh. owns a 20 acre parcel and uh, Leland uh, also farms this bad boy. And so he has 100 year old vines, 25 year old and 78. And so this came from the 78. We only got one row of it. Um, we only made four barrels of this wine, all American oak. I really like American oak with old vine zins. I think it really helps fill in that mid palate. Nice and dry. This is definitely a big wine. Um, you know, in 2019, there was a little heat wave that came through and uh, these old vines are just fully exposed to the elements. And so it, uh, the sugar spiked a little bit and we picked it. And so it, it's around, I think we got it at 25, 26 bricks. Um, this is a big boy. So it's about 15 and a half, 16% alcohol. And uh, really, really great acidity though. And the tannins are just right, right in your face. I really love this one. Um, definitely a steak zen. Uh, and, and also this is a great example of an age worthy zen. This is a wine that you can really lay down and when you taste it, you'll feel the tannins. And so this is going to soften over time and it's going to go from that big grippy tannin to some silky, smooth, velvety tannins. And so this is just a nice, rich, bold Zinfandel. Wow. Yeah, I mean, really. This, this is definitely, uh, I mean, these are, I mean, I consider these, the taste of this, it's almost like of a library one. 
something of a collector's that you already i mean you have a good agent on it already you got 18 months on it man. I mean, that's yeah, yeah that's very nice obviously asian a little bit longer will even it just it's gonna 100 change everything on it right but this is this is amazing again aromatics i'm great your tannins are beautiful as well and in your flavor profile on this man it's i could like a, with a tomahawk you said when you think something really meaty right? yeah. this is this is definitely this is definitely it man i really well i i'm looking forward to tasting your last one because these two have been my you know my favorite style because this, yeah these yeah. are these are great but these are extraordinary what i've just tasted the you know so far so no it's it's a lot of fun you know we we really pride ourselves on the reds and and how we age them and the barrels we select for them and and really each one of these wines that you've went through, and this is where I get really excited about anything we do here at Christopher Sellers, is they're dramatically different. We're mm -hmm. really trying to hone in on the terroir of each vineyard. And almost everything we do is a vineyard designate. And, and the prime goal is to really showcase the, the varietal itself and then where it's farmed. And, and really giving credit to that farmer because, you know, especially in Lodi, um, these these wine growers are working so hard and and we really do want to give back and, and showcase them because when once again when you're picking those very ripe high high bricks you're not really able to see all the hard work they put into it you know it makes a very approachable wine but you know when they're thinning at three different times and getting all those varietal characteristics you're losing some of that so by picking earlier we're able to achieve all of that so just yeah really really excited uh, yeah, about and, the whole and lineup there. and i love that about your lineup they all you know none of them are like when, when you're coming to your red starting off with your sinal it was it don't it, it stands on its own yeah it, you know yeah. you're not it doesn't taste like anything else so your rosé is very unique and also your chardonnay so Sometimes I think uh, the winemaker, at times I've had wine, they, 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 there's a lot of similarities to it. And when you're tasting, like, what am I really tasting, right? Is it, yeah, yeah. Is it all the Everything's same? Everything's kind of tasting. Uh, you know, sometimes tastes you, same, sometimes, right? you sometimes love your style so much that you forget, you know, and I will say, does the average consumer taste like this? You know, not really, right? And so if you, if you did have a specific style, but once again, I don't think it shows the hard work. I mean, that's, right. you know, farming, being a farmer myself now for the last few years, the amount of effort and work that go into <laughs> a vineyard is 10x what goes into a winery. I tell you what, right. like farming is like its own animal. Mother nature gives you no mercy. There is no conversation. There's no phone call with mother nature. It is full, brutal, like honesty, punching you in the face all the time. And you're having to react and, and then hopefully make the right decisions constantly. And so we really like showcasing that side because there is like, you should not taste my 2019 Chardonnay that we sold out if people are still selling that. Uh -huh. It should not taste like the 2020. I like pride myself. Right, like, it right, is, right. We actually did a um, an event for our wine club about a month or two ago. And it was, uh, you know, wine club members only. And they were tasting the 2019 with the 2020. And then the vineyard owner was out here talking about the vintages. And I was talking about the winemaking. And I'll tell you what, it was the first time I tasted them side by side. And it, they were dramatically different. And yeah. that's because mother nature gave us different weather patterns and they should be different. You know, we're not making Pepsi here. We're making right. liquid art. That's how I look at it. You know, I'm, I'm showcasing my art to you and then you decide if my art meets your standard and then you know if you if you enjoy it and and that's that's what drew me to wine and why i'm so passionate and love it so much because it is like an art piece and each one of these bottles are going to evolve over time and that art's going to change and mold right. into its own thing so and i, and I love, that about, a lot I love that about you and i love that about you because a lot of uh, I, I, you have the extreme when a mass producer wants everything to always taste the same regardless of the year, right? Uh, and they do, they're mostly uh, science-based versus gut-based, right? And, I, and, I, and, I, and I, how do you consider yourself? You're more science or more gut-based when you're making your, your wines? 
Well, I, so I let the science guide me to a degree, right? So, you know, it is winemaking. There is a lot of science behind it. Right. But at the end of the day, I'm also a businessman. And so I know what my customers and what I like. And right. so a lot of it is flavors, right? Um, if, if the acid's off in the vineyard, um, as long as it tastes great, right? That's what matters. And then there's also, there's a lot of variables variables that people are not truly honest with, right? So for instance, this is real time happening. Um, I made a picking decision to pick um, tomorrow to get some old vines in it. And we can't get crews. Like there is a massive shortage in labor, California right now. We're down 40% with farm labor right now. Wow. And so, you know, is that gonna change the wine a little bit? Sure, and that's gonna sure. be part of the story of 2021 <laughs> there was a massive shortage and 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 i'm okay and i'm okay to stand behind that because it's the truth and and i'm really just big on being authentic and yeah you know showcasing what what's out there like it there's a lot of variables that play in how these wines turn out and yeah of course we want to perfect it um but getting it right in the vineyard is most important for me right. um, and that's where we spend almost all of our time is working with these great farmers wine growers getting it right in the vineyard. And then for me here, it's coddling, right? I'm right. not manipulating, I'm not tweaking. I'm just coddling it. I'm letting it, you know, letting it age in these pretty barrels and make sure I top it off at time. And then, uh, and then we'll make some fun blends for the wine club. Uh, but for the most part, we're doing a lot of vineyard testing, so. And, that, and that's awesome. I really, yeah. I really uh, love that because like you said, winemaking is an art, right? And I don't, I don't want you to be selling the same piece every year to everyone, right? Yeah, I feel like I feel boring. like I have something. Yeah, it's boring to feel like you got something unique. And every year you're like, you, you know, I could you could brag about it. Like I have the 2018, I got the 20. What do you got? Well, I only got the 20. I'm like, well, there you go. Yeah, I, I got yeah. something that you don't, right? And that's yeah. what I, I think that's the camaraderie you get as well is with that people come together because they're like, what is he going to produce next? Because it was so good last year, so what's how do you, how is it going to make it work, right? And I definitely. think uh, you're definitely doing that, Chris. I mean, I I'm pretty surprised. I mean, so far your Barbera and your Zen reminds me of a very high end winery up in Napa, which I was that's the, the immediate association I had with your wine. Um, but I was like, wow, man, that is that close for that Zen. And I was like, man, that's if I now decant it, I think you could. I mean, you can go side by side, you wouldn't know the difference. I mean, that's oh, pretty. Yeah. That's no, that's pretty. great. I'm not, yeah, appreciate the, the positive feedback. This last wine here is our 2018 Petit Bordeaux. Um, 100% Petit Bordeaux. I really get excited about that because uh, you normally, I think of all the Petit Bordeaux made in California, only 5% make it in a standalone. Um, all French oak. It's been in bottle now for a year and a half. And I'll tell you what, I opened it up about a month ago. We're releasing this in the wine club in um, November. And this is just, it's a beast. It's beautiful. I love the acid. I love the tannin. Um, I love the French oak on it. And it just has this great, great structure. The 2019, I'm even more excited about because we umped up the French oak and we're not gonna okay. have to age it as long to be uh, approachable. Um, this one, I think we did, uh, I wanna say we did 60% new French okay. oak um, for, for 18 months. And then uh, it's been, like I said, yeah, bottled now for a year and a half and it's just, it's a beautiful wine. This is a great steak wine, really bold. Um, if you like Napa Cab, this yeah. is this is the Lodi version here. We don't do, you know, Lodi <laughs> Cabs will never be as beasty as a Napa Cab, but this Petit Bordeaux is right up in there. And and the tannins are now turning velvet. You know, now that it's been aging, it, there's a lot of velvet. Um, there is definitely some sediment in the bottle. Okay. And you'll see that. Um, when you pull the cork out, and that's the tannin binding up with the oxygen and, and settling out, and some wine crystals, some of the, the acid is smoothing out. And so uh, this is just a, a big boy. I love pairing this with ribeye. I'm a big ribeye guy. So okay. this wine, ribeye are, uh, are, are my two go-to, so. 
I don't think I've had, uh, you know, a petit verdot on its own as well, because it's always, you know, in a blend, yeah, right? It's always so, in a blend. Yeah, not many people place. like, yeah, it's very rare. I think there's one winery in Amador that I know does 100% petit verdot. And besides that, I, I honestly can't tell you. I think Ink Block with Michael David, I think that's 100% petit verdot. Um, but besides that, I don't really know of many wineries doing it. And I really do think it's a slight disjustice to the varietal because it does stand on its own so well. And it has this floral characteristic, a lot of blackberry, mm -hmm. little jammy notes, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful wine. And I just love the tannin um, and the color on it. So yeah, it's just a great wine. I think the, the acidity and the dryness that, that's that's like your finish at the end, right? Yeah. It's like yeah, it really that, that it, acidity. That acidity yeah, it really, that comes that it really comes through. Really comes through. Like you said, beautiful colors, amazing and aromatics. We, and this is like, correct me if I'm wrong. You're looking at the bottle. I don't. And I think it's like 13.5, 13.2. I could be wrong on that, but uh, the alcohol is not 13.5. 13.5, right? Okay, yeah. And so we um, we picked it. We picked it early. Once again. Um, I, I have this big old belief that you don't have to let the fruit get very, very ripe here because it's still going to be very fruit forward. And I like getting that acidity in there because it really gives the wine balance mm -hmm. because we do have so much fruit. And so giving it that, that balance from fruit to acidity is, I think, just key to making not only age-worthy wines, but just balanced wines. And so this right. is just a great... Uh, Great showcase. And this is in the Alta Mesa ABA. This is coming from that Bar Bartholomew family vineyards, which is our estate vineyard on site here. Well, talking about, you know, Latinos and, and not knowing, you know, maybe how to, uh, you know, what to feel comfortable, something I've been doing with my kids. And this is really something not only Latinos, but everyone can like take and, and do this real time at their house to help become a, one, a better taster, smeller. If you look at the education system as a whole, the one thing we do not focus on, whether it's at school or at our house, is our sense of smell. Right. But in the wine industry, it is the most powerful tool, your sense of smell, being able to you know, smell things and, and, and really know what you're smelling and being able to pick that up and then to describe it. It's, it's one of the most important things. And so I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a 10-month-old. And so <laughs> for my five and three-year-old, my two girls, what I do is we'll get about 20 wine glasses and I'll blindfold them. And then I'll take coffee beans and I'll put it in one. I'll take lemon and I'll zest it. I'll take lime, zest it. I'll crush blueberries, raspberries. I'll take cinnamon sticks, break them in half, throw them in. Uh, you know, nutmeg, you know, all the different descriptors that you see on a daily basis. And right. we blindfold them and we do this, you know, sometimes once a month, sometimes every few months, you know, right now it's harvest. We haven't done it, you know, right. in a few months, but I'm trying to do it pretty consistent just to, and I make it fun. It's a total game, uh, you know, a little competition between the two sisters. So they love it. And I kid you not, you know, I know everyone likes to brag about their kids, but I, my five-year-old, will go through all 20 wine glasses and she'll beat me sometimes. I'll mix up <laughs> lemon zest and lime zest almost every time. I'm like, oh, that's lemon. Oh, nope, it's lime. And I, I do it almost every time, but she'll go all the way through. Coffee, cinnamon, nutmeg. I mean, it's amazing. And you, if you introduce it at a young age, it's just like learning a second language, right? I mean, right. Early on, and now it's all, <laughs> excuse me, it's all sticking. And so same thing, I mean, it's it's so much fun. And I'll tell our customers, you know, hey, a good way to get better is just by, you know, and you know, you see the wine descriptive of Sauvignon Blanc, grapefruit or, or lemongrass, you know, go get some grapefruit, squeeze it in a glass, have the wine and smell it and see if you can pick it up. Right, you know, right. And, and just kind of go back and forth. And it's just, it's fun. It, you know, you have a, you know, for adults, get a few glasses of wine going and then do it. So it's, uh, you know, really fun then. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and you know, it's, it's funny. I talk to a lot of teachers and, you know, normally in the, in the classroom, you're trying to avoid all the smells, right? 
you know, you right. don't want to smell BO or, <laughs> or, or someone's perfume or cologne. And you're trying right. to avoid any discussion around the, you know, yeah. the way they smell. And, and it totally makes sense. And so, you know, but once again, you know, thinking of the wine industry and even the restaurant industry, right. when you go into a restaurant, I mean, the way things smell and presentation and look, you know, it plays such a role in that experience, right? Man, Chris, I really enjoyed your, your time today. Thank you for sharing your awesome story. I love that, you know, I get to feature you for Latino Heritage Month. You have an awesome story. Uh, you know, you have your, your wines alone. I love the fact that they stand on each own. And uh, they don't they don't blend in, you know what I mean? You, yeah, you did yeah. that. My favorite, your Barbera, your what I consider your little library wines here. <laughs> your Barbera, your Zen. I mean, your Zen was it took me it took me to a place in Napa. Your Barbera wow. took me to another place up north, which a gentleman that makes something very similar. Which I was, you, you did. I'm going to introduce you to him because okay. I was amazed of what what came out of this. Wow, um, that's so, great. Dude, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate your time. And I'm looking forward to meeting you soon. Yes, thank you, Oscar. Thank you so much. And thanks for featuring us. We appreciate the support. So Awesome, awesome man. Well, keep doing great things. All right. Have a good one. Likewise.